Abrasion is the first score that is featured when you come to reviewing a numeric on a glove stamp. And so you'll have your EN 388 2016 now score, and the first number that will feature there, as is on this particular glove, is an abrasion level four. What does that mean? How do we understand what that actual score means? And how does that defer, or how does that deviate from what it was from the original 2003 score? The first thing is that the actual abrasion pad, and this is the actual, this lovely orange, this is the actual abrasion pad that has now been specified globally. And so what they've done is with standardizing the abrasion pad, you have now got an even playing field for all manufacturers around the world. And that is a wonderful thing. What we also found was that because of the previous abrasion pad being varied, you could hit the ceiling very easily. So when you were achieving an abrasion level four, there were too many gloves achieving abrasion level four. And so by introducing this particular pad, that has changed that ceiling. It's made it much more difficult to actually get that abrasion level four. Another misunderstanding about the actual journey of abrasion is that people think it goes linear, i.e. it'll go from zero, one, two, three, and four in a straight line, but it doesn't work like that. The actual journey of that curve is exponential. And the way that I can demonstrate that is if you have a look at this particular chart that is over my face right now, is that actual abrasion level one is only a minimal 100 cycles. But abrasion level four, when you take the journey through two and three, goes all the way up to 8,000 cycles. That is a very important note to put in the back of your mind when you're doing cost and use or longevity associated to your particular glove selection. Another thing just to bear in mind as well is that the actual test when it is done, just this is just some general information, is that you'll take a piece of material from the palm um, and that'll be a full cutout. So that'll be both the actual coating that is on the outside, i.e. the black piece, and then a piece of the liner that is on the inside. And that all is then actually applied and rotated onto the abrasion pad. Only when the full journey of the coating and the liner goes all the way through the abrasion pad to the metal at the back does it short circuit and end the abrasion count. So it's not only about the actual outer coating. And some people think that when you get through the coating, you've arrived at the end of the glove. No, there is still life in that glove when you have gone through the coating. So just bear that in mind. You might be throwing away your gloves prematurely and you might get a little bit more life out of them as well and therefore save some cost. Hands down, the area that has caused the most confusion in the entire safety glove industry is the emotional topic of cut protection. How are we now measuring this cut protection and what on earth do the numbers mean and what do the alpha references mean? So to try and make this as simple as possible because we do have two different measures. The best way for me to explain this is quite simply that if you're looking at the coupe side, the coupe element, which is the numeric, is always in reference to an element of exposure. Just think of it as exposure, and I'll explain that very shortly. And when you're referring to the TDM or the ISO score, that is a reference to pressure. So we use those two words very specifically, exposure for the CUBE score, and we use pressure for the ISO score. And the reason why these numbers are both equally relevant is because in different environments, you're coming across different risks and different hazards. The way that the coupe score is done is by using a specific weight, five newtons, and a blade. And that blade, uh, being circular, runs over that fabric backwards and forwards. And what it's trying to do is cut through that fabric, but with a relatively light newton force. And that would be equivalent to a light engineering environment or a maintenance crew who are working with sharp edges, but they're not necessarily exerting extreme amounts of force onto their hands. Go over here to the ISO score, and what we start talking about is pressure. This is a straight blade over a piece of material, and it's almost the equivalent of taking a standing knife over an actual piece of material and understanding how much pressure is it gonna take for me to get that standing knife through. And the lowest pressure is two newtons, which is about 200 grams of weight on a blade, up to 30 newtons, which is three kilograms of weight going through that blade onto the actual surface. So keep the perspective separate. What you have here is a coop score that is helping you with exposure, and what you have is an ISO score that is helping you with pressure and there are numerics associated 
to each of those. Tear for me is absolutely the most underwhelming of the scores in EN388. And there are two particular reasons why it actually takes the jam out of my particular donut. One of them is that the actual tear speed that is being used to determine the tear ratio or the tear strength of a glove is not indicative of real life. The tear itself is moving at a speed of 10 centimeters per minute. And I say to you, well, where would you see that kind of a tear occur? Unless we're dealing with slots, there's a high probability we're not gonna be seeing that in our workforce. And if you are, you might need to revisit your workforce. That is the first concern that I have with the tear result. The second is that gloves nowadays are actually built to fit our hands. They are built with elastane and spandex and they are seamlessly knitted so that they fit onto your hand like a sock to maximize comfort and to really enhance your dexterity. In doing so, that has changed massively from what gloves were like 20 to 25 years ago uh, when elements of this test result were actually originally implemented because a lot of the gloves that used to be featured were very baggy on the hands and so there was a high probability for entanglement or there was a high probability for some kind of snaring on different bits of machinery and you would need to see if that glove could actually tear to prevent injury perhaps. All right. So again, the tear result for me is a very interesting one. It shouldn't be the foundation for how you are making a glove decision. It is something to consider, it is something to be aware of, but it, it shouldn't be the number one driver for where you're going. So, for the puncture score and or test how this is now measured, this creates a lot of confusion. And I think it's because of the word puncture and the misconception associated to puncture. How do I know what puncture you're actually talking about? And so the immediate association to puncture is usually to do with hypodermic needles because that's what we think puncture would be associated to. But unfortunately, in this particular instance uh, with EN388, it couldn't be further from the truth. The actual instrument used to determine puncture is a simple roofing nail. This is a fascinating insight as well for me about puncture resistance because I've seen some people make some specific commercial decisions, very emotive commercial decisions about puncture based on the score. And when you look at it actually with a zoomed in view, you will see that the way that the yarn is knitted, there are cavities, there are gaps, there are spaces for that nail to actually work its way through. And so the way that I usually describe the puncture score quite simply, is that it is a big game of luck. I know that sounds terrible, but it is the truth. And the reason why I say that is because of the way that the actual yarn is meshed over each other, where the nail is hitting, it could be hitting at a cross section, it could be hitting at an actual piece of the material, or conversely, it could actually be going straight through one of those intersections. And that is and ultimately can be a game of luck. So bear that in mind when you're making your decision about puncture resistance, and just remember that there are parameters, there are limitations to the way that puncture resistance is actually measured in reality. The rate that puncture is also measured is very different to what you would maybe expect. When you are getting a puncture injury, it is usually quick. Think about a, an insole for a shoe, you're stepping on a nail, Think about your hand, that puncture is gonna happen quickly. The actual test and the way that the test is measured is at 10 centimeters per minute. And that is how slow the actual puncture test is conducted. And only once that actual needle penetrates through that material is then the Newton force associated to it registered. And the deviation on the Newton force is approximately 20 Newtons, 20 to 60 Newtons for a puncture level one and you're looking at 150 Newtons for a puncture level four. So just bear that in mind. A lot of people think hypodermic needle, very sharp puncture, very quickly. It couldn't be more different to the reality of how the test is done. It is done with a roofing nail and it is done at a very, very slow puncture rate against a level of pressure.